Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Teresa Shields Parker. You know, faith is foundational on our spirit-led transformation journeys. I mean, without it, we have no transformation. Without it, we can't be spirit-led. So just what is faith? And how do we know if we are living our lives based on faith? Now, you guys know I'm a words person, so let's see what the dictionary has to say about faith. It defines it as complete trust or confidence in someone or something. That's the first definition. Second one is a strong belief in God. So, you know, Hebrews 11, 1 through 2 has long been the go-to verse to explain what faith is. And it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. But we read that and say, okay, but what does that mean? So to help us understand it better, I always go to the Amplified Bible it, it just has a way of explaining things a lot better. And it, it says it this way. Faith is the assurance, title deed, confirmation of things hoped for or divinely guaranteed and the evidence of things not seen or the conviction of their reality. Faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. For by this kind of faith, the men, and I'm going to say and women, of old gained divine approval. Now, remember, the dictionary definition of faith is that faith in God or complete confidence in him comes from our foundational knowledge that we can trust him to lead us. Okay. I mean that if you apply the dictionary definition, that's what it means. Foundational knowledge. We know that we can trust him. In other words, we have to have complete assurance that God is leading us and the eventual outcome of where he is leading us will be for our good and his glory. Like it says in Romans 8, 28, we have the title deed to whatever the outcome is that God wants to happen. We have the title deed to whatever God has already put in our hands. Now, several years ago, uh, my husband and I reached a milestone on our financial journey and paid off our house. Now, we have the title deed to our home. It's ours. Whatever God is telling you and me, if we have faith, then it's as good as a document in our hands for whatever he is promising us will happen. It's ours. It's, it's not just guaranteed by a financial institution. It's divinely guaranteed by the God of the universe who just happens to be our daddy, right? The next part is a little harder to understand because it's in the future. And it says faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. God already sees it. He has called what we can't see as if it has already happened because he stands outside of time and he can see the whole picture, including what happened from beginning to the end of our lives, because he's not just in the present, he's in the past and he's in the future. So our faith in God has to help us comprehend as fact what we cannot actually see touch, or feel right now. We cannot experience it in this moment by our physical senses. 
but we trust God and have faith that what he has said will come to pass. So, you know, this really relates to 2 Corinthians 5, 7, where Paul tells us we walk by faith, not by what we see. Friends, wouldn't it, it wouldn't be faith if we could see it. That wouldn't be faith. That would just be reality, right? But in the Bible, especially Hebrews 11, it lists men and women of faith who have gone before us and gained God's approval because of how they lived lives of faith. They are examples for us of how to walk in faith, even when we cannot see the future. But we, like they did, have a divine promise, and that's our guarantee of what will happen when we put feet or action to our faith or to what God has told us to do. So in Romans 4, Paul seems to kind of go off on a tangent about Abraham, whom he calls our forefather according to the flesh or, you know, humanly speaking. So for this podcast series, I was originally just going to skip over Romans 4, but really God kept calling me back to it because faith is a foundational pillar on my spirit-led journey, transformation journey, and it will be on yours as well. But my big question with Abraham's story was, why does God call Abraham the father of faith when Abraham failed so many times. And as I read his story, I saw that every time Abraham failed, he recognized his fail failure. It's, it's there in black and white. Whoever he had wronged forgave him, and so did God. You know, he is not our forefather of faith because he was perfect. He is the forefather of faith because at critical junctures in his life, he listened to God and followed him. I guess you would say at the times that really mattered, he did what God wanted him to do. So to understand why Paul is talking about Abraham, we need to begin in Romans 3.22, where it says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So the way we are made right with God is by faith in Jesus. That's foundational. And then in 27 through 28 of Romans 3, it says, Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal, acquittal is not based on obeying the law, or the rules. It is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the rules. In these words, Paul is trying to get those who are still following the Jewish laws and sacrifices for their salvation to understand that faith is now the foundation for salvation, not the law, not the rules. And although the law is good, it is no longer how God counts salvation. So just because we follow the Ten Commandments perfectly, that does not mean we are saved. We are not saved by what we do. But if we have faith, it's going to move us to appropriate actions without following a huge set of rules. So Paul explains in Romans 4, 14, and then 16 through 17, um, he says this, if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. 
Now, here's the key. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. So how did Abraham's life show he believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing? I kind of see three times in his life that that this revealed his belief. First, it's when Abraham left his home to go to a place where God would show him. And in doing that, God promised to give the land where, where God um, led him to the land where he, he, um, where he would, um, make his, make his new home. He would give that land to him and to his descendants. And this was when Abraham had no children at all. Hebrews 11, eight through nine tells us this. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed God when God called him to leave home and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith, for he was like a foreigner living in tents. So his actions revealed that he believed God could create new things out of nothing. And my friends, That's faith. So the second time that I see this being played out in Abraham's life um, was when he opened Sarah's womb at age nine. When God opened Sarah's womb at the age of 90, I'm sorry, I don't know what I said there, but it was when Abraham opened Sarah's womb when she was 90 years old way past childbearing age. Abraham himself was a hundred years old. In Romans 3, 18 through 20, Paul says, even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about a 100 years of age, he figured his body as good as dead. And so was Sarah's womb. So now we understand why they both laughed when God told them Sarah would have a baby. You can see that in Genesis 17 and 18. I would have too, wouldn't you? But when the baby was born, Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. All who hear about this will laugh with me. Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse a baby? Yet I have given Abraham a son in his old age. That's in Genesis 21. And they named the baby Isaac, which means he laughed. Then the third time when God was when um, God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, who was his son of promise from God. Yet Abraham trusted what God had said and by faith believed that somehow, even if he had to go through with sacrificing Isaac, God would bring him back to life. It says that in uh, Hebrews 11, 17 through 19, it was by faith that Abraham offered Isaac as a sacrifice when God was testing him. Abraham, who had received God's promises, was ready to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, even though God had told him, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Abraham reasoned that if Isaac died, God was able to bring him back to life again. And in a sense, Abraham did receive his son, back from the dead. I mean, I got to say it again, friends, that's faith, because I don't really think I have the level of faith to even begin to process sacrificing either one of my children, even though they're grown. I still couldn't do it. 
Lest we think Abraham was godlike, <laughs> we need to remember the times. There were actually two times when he passed his wife off as his sister, trying to protect himself. And he stepped right into some messes, right? He lied about her partly out of fear because she was so beautiful and was afraid someone would kill him for her. In truth, it was part lie because she was his half sister, but he was married to her. So that was the lie, which he didn't fess up to in at least two cases. Um, we just failed to mention it, maybe. Who knows? At the time, um, marrying your half sister was legal, was a legal union. It wasn't forbidden in scripture until much later. But God got Abraham out of both situations. First, he sent plagues on Pharaoh, who had taken Sarah to be his wife. That's in Genesis 12. And revealing the truth in a dream to Abimelech, who was, who also wanted to marry her in Genesis 20. So in the first instance, Abraham was lucky to be escorted out of the country with his wife and possessions. In the second situation, we see clearly that he was sorry and he paid restitution to Abimelech. You know, another decision that wasn't Abraham's finest moment was listening to Sarah, who told him to sleep with her maid, Hagar, in order to have a child because Sarah felt she was done for and couldn't get pregnant. It's clear from scripture that Abraham did this willingly. It likely made sense to him because God had promised to make his descendants as numerous as the stars, says that in Genesis 15. But God used both Ishmael, the son of the servant, and Isaac, Sarah's son, to accomplish that promise that he had made to Abraham. God made it clear that Isaac, though, was the son of promise. So when Isaac was about to be weaned, and you probably know the story, but Abraham prepared a, a big party. And during the party, Sarah saw 13-year-old Ishmael making fun of her baby Isaac, right? And demanded that Abraham send Ishmael and his mother away. Now, scripture tells us that this kind of upset Abraham because Ishmael was also his son. And then in Genesis 21, Abraham, or God tells Abraham to do what Sarah says because Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. He added that he would also make a nation out of Ishmael's descendants. So Abraham sent Ishmael and Hagar away. The promise Abraham was given was a promise only Isaac inherited. In Genesis 26, after Abraham dies, God tells Isaac, I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars of the sky, and I will give them all these lands, though your, through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. But get this part, I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. See, it's not because of the times Abraham messed up. It's because his actions revealed that at the, these crucial times in his life, when God showed him what to do, he trusted God and did what God said. You know, the first part of the book of Romans is really about the struggle between those who wanted a rule book to follow and those who understood that Jesus was teaching a deeper truth, that spiritual truth of living by faith and living in God's grace. As people, we all tend to want rules. We do but then we don't follow them. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. That seems like easier than trusting God to lead us. That's kind of nebulous. 
We don't know, not for sure if we'll get it right. You know, I remember back when I was much younger, probably in my 20s, I would say to God, just tell me what to do. Like you did Noah, like give me the exact dimension of whatever ark I am to build. But I think I failed to understand the extreme ridicule that Noah went through spending those years building a huge boat that nobody knew why he was doing it. He was the laughing stop stock of the whole area until the floods came. So faith really isn't a difficult concept to grasp. We have faith that when we go to work, we're going to get a paycheck, right? You know, there were a few times when my husband and I were newly married that he was working at small businesses and his paychecks started bouncing. Now, that will cause you to lose faith in your boss and your workplace really quickly. We think when we do X, Y, Z, we are promised a certain result. For instance, if I follow the latest, greatest diet to a T, I will lose X amount of weight. Now, this might work, but nine times out of 10, it doesn't work like promised because we are all different. So back when I was into diets, I would always blame myself because I could never follow it perfectly, right? And when I did, I might lose some weight. But the issue was when I stopped following the diet, went back to normal eating, I gained it all back plus more. Why? I hadn't learned anything. I was following someone else's rules. I had no intention of making those any part of my ongoing lifestyle. Now, this is the same thing with the law. God doesn't want us to follow a set of rules. He wants us to follow him. And friends, that is so much more difficult than following, than following, you know, rules, following him. Very, you know, it's like feels risky. You know, when we follow rules, at least we know what the rules are and we know if we didn't follow them. But when we are following God, it seems more difficult to discern what to do. Maybe that's because our faith is in the rules rather than in God. So faith in God has to be the main ingredient in any spirit-led transformation. What that means is we trust God no matter what he says. Our faith then will always result in spirit-led action. And any other action is actually useless anyway, isn't it? You know, James 2, 21 through 24, and then verse 26 has a lot to say about this. And actually, I didn't realize, I didn't remember that James 2 talks about Abraham. So it says, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. Isn't that a great a uh, title to have. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So, you know, fear many times keeps us from stepping out in faith. What if I didn't hear from God right? What if that wasn't even God? But Abraham gives me a whole lot of hope. He definitely didn't get it right all the time, friends. Maybe Ishmael wasn't in God's plan, but somehow that act did not get counted against Abraham. What God saw were all the times Abraham's faith moved him forward 
on his own personal spirit-led transformation journey. Romans 4, 20 through 24 says it this way, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous. And when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. The important thing about Abraham's life is that he showed God he had faith when he did something God told him to do, when his actions showed that he actually had faith, like when he left home and headed to who knows where, or when he trusted God to give him an air of promise, or when he raised the knife to sacrifice that same beloved gift from God. Yeah, his faith led to action. Now, any any of these actions without directions from God would not have been the same. We can't go out and copy Abraham's actions and be counted as faithful because that was Abraham's journey. And ours may be even more difficult than his. How can we see a way to pay the insurmountable amount of debt we have? How can we restore the broken relationship in our marriage or with our children or with our friends? How can we lose the mountain of weight that has attached itself to our bodies? Faith in what God asks you to do is always the answer. But that faith must be backed by whatever action God is telling you to take. That's really key. Don't take an action that's just of your own making. Make sure it's what God wants you to do. This is why I don't give you a diet plan in Overcomers Academy. I teach you how to follow God to get that plan. So, you know, you might have to wait for the plan. You might. You might ask God. You might have to wait to, under, to really understand it. Now, I hope you don't have to wait like Abraham did until he was 100. But, hey, he lived to be 175. So there's that, too. It's all relative, my friends. Sometimes we have to wait until we're ready to do what God is telling us to do. I feel like I really started living by faith on my transformation journey around 2009 when I was, uh, I was over 50, probably around 56. It took me lots of years to lose 250 pounds, friends. First, I had to totally surrender to God and trust him for the next step on my journey. I had to get his lifestyle change plan for me and do what he said to implement it. I made a lot of mistakes on my journey, and as such, I am very well equipped to steer you and others away from my same mistakes. Well, one of the most beautiful and spiritual parts of any transformation journey is learning how to have real faith in Jesus and be led by the Holy Spirit in each step we take, and then the grace, mercy, favor, and glory of God will surround us as we walk in tandem with him. And that's our goal. Is it easy? I mean, some of the things that Abraham did might look easy. I mean, who knows? Maybe he was glad to get away from his mother and father and go somewhere, you know, new and exciting and adventurous. However, it definitely wasn't easy waiting for his promised son. And I don't think for a minute it was easy preparing to sacrifice his promised son. 
Yet through it all, he trusted God. And I like to think it all started with that first step out of the door of his homeland, going to a place that God said he would show him. That's faith. Let me ask you, what would it look like for you to have that kind of faith on your spirit-led transformation journey? What would it take to do whatever God is whispering in your heart to do? It's time. He's calling you. Will you have the faith to take the next step? Let me pray for you. Father God, I lift your children to you today. Give them clear directions. Remind them of your promises. Help them make that next step on their journey, whatever that may be. Make it clear to them. Give them the faith to take action in Jesus' name. Now, as always, the action steps and challenges for this lesson will be in the Spirit-Led Transformation course, along with the video and transcripts. This course is only available in Overcomers Academy. So go to TeresaShieldsParker.com backslash Overcomers in, or in order to join. That link will be in the show notes. Until next week, sweet grace for your journey.